Swarm is we're a community of builders and founders. Uh, and we're creating a space right now for uh, product builders, developers, designers, and product managers to team up and to connect around freelance projects. So at the moment, we're building our community and we've had the privilege of having access to such a great network. Folks who are being, uh, folks who are building communities, folks who are building their own companies. And I had the pleasure of uh, introducing my team member, Aaron, uh, our CTO, who's get, uh, Swarm's CTO. Um, <laughs> hey guys. My former company, I was notoriously introverted. Um, so the roles have changed. I am now the extrovert of the company. And Aaron is the resident. Massive, the massive <laughs> introvert. Yes. Um, before we get started, I just want to say welcome. I, I wanted to especially welcome Python PH, uh, Matt uh, Python PH's uh, current president. He introduced himself as just a volunteer in our prep <laughs> call. I was like, that's the signature modesty. But um, just it's great that um, you know you matter here and representing Python PH and some other folks. I, I know that uh, folks from the Google Developer Community is here. Excalibur is here. Uh, a number of us who've worked at Calibur, please represent. I think actually some of you don't might not have even met each other. And uh, Product PH is actually joining us in a little bit. So it's really great. It's an opportunity. This is kind of like the crossroads. Uh, for a number of different communities. Mm -hmm. So to introduce um, uh, our speakers, uh, I'm going to pass it off to Aaron. Um, please also feel free to drop your questions in chat. Uh, just chat everyone. And also don't be afraid to introduce yourself. Just say like if you're a part of a specific community, I do call out, please introduce yourself in the chat. Okay. All right, Aaron, uh, I'll give you the privilege of in, um, introducing our guests. All right. Thanks, Dexter. So we, we have two very special guests today. But before we get into that, um, just a brief intro of what we're kind of like the theme of what we're going to talk about today. It's going to be about geotech, right? So geotech has been kind of an unsung hero in our lives, but it's changed our lives dramatically. And, you know, we just take it for granted every day. Maps is generally something we use daily, yet it changed the way we navigate and interact with the world, right? Today, we are talking to a technology leader who helps millions of people find their way daily. So today we have Philip. Um, Philip Candle is an engineering leader who has built teams, companies, and communities around the globe. He co-founded Scobbler, um, a geotech company from Germany with a team in Romania. So yeah, he's, you know, he's everywhere, essentially. And he's also the chairman of the largest tech company uh, community um, in Eastern Europe. Now he currently heads engineering for Grab Geo. We also have Matt, who um, Dexter already introduced a bit earlier. He's also, you know, not a stranger in the tech community for sure. He's working three full-time jobs at the moment as a tech lead, a Python consultant or trainer, and as a senior engineer for various companies. Currently, he is also the co-founder and president of Python PH. So I guess he is technically still a volunteer, but yeah, <laughs> he's also the president. We also have a lot of people in the in chat. Um, we have Mickey in the community. I think I saw Francis earlier. Um, some people I just want to give shout outs to. <laughs> we also have people from, from Caliber. Um, thanks for joining in, guys. Today is going to be fun. Yeah, Dexter, how are we going to move on to next yeah you want to start no yeah i think like uh what what i really appreciated about both matt and philip not only are you tech leaders you've built you, you were senior ic's you've built teams built companies and built ecosystems but i think where we can really um you know like kind of kick off and, and start is uh Philip, I know you have a really interesting origin story about how you first decided to become an engineer. Maybe share it with everyone that can uh, get us kicked off. Yeah, I'm absolutely happy to. And thank, thank you so much for both having me here. It seems like you have an amazing community of people, um, which is what I've liked throughout my entire life. I've enjoyed like hanging out with people that are passionate about what they do. And all of you here by being here Saturday, demonstrate clearly that this is not work, but this is truly passion project. So really, really appreciate having the chance to spend like an hour or so with all of you. Um, and back back to your to your uh, question, Dexter, right? Like, so as, as I shared like earlier, so I, I was 
I was when I was young, I got into computers through gaming, right? Like, I mean, obviously I wanted to play computer games, but I, I figured out that buying computer games is very, very expensive. So I had to teach myself engineering skills to crack those computer games. So thank God this is a long time ago that it's not that I can't be prosecuted for this anymore. But basically I got into like the, the, the cracking scene. How can you like um, circumvent like copy protection in computer games? And that has led me down like the rabbit hole going like a lot into like the security and hacking scene. And at some point in time, I was like, leading the largest German uh, computer hacking forum in the internet was like over 10,000 members at some point, which was in the 90s quite big for an internet community. So that was my origin story, what got me originally through cracking, through programming and computer security. Right. I was always curious though, like how did those communities like start out? Like, did you just, you know, did somebody make a website and then people just find it online? Like, how do those things usually start? So in my case, what was actually is like, it started in the, in the physical world, right? Like I had a few friends that had the same problem that like, um, basically like we like solved the problem of like not paying for computer games together. And then I think like once, once, once a few of us got together, then we actually like started a webpage, started like a, a small forum. And like at that time, like bulletin boards were like really big. So you could like get like these like very low cost, like bulletin board forums. And we just like, I didn't really like any of the other bulletin boards that were around in Germany at that time. So we just started our own and just like few folks that I met like from real life, like where like volunteering to be moderators and, and then just like people just in, in massive amounts, like signed up and like connected. And like, again, like I met like a lot of friends in real world, like up to this day through these like uh, old, like uh, computer hacking times. Very interesting. Very fascinating, actually. Um, Matt, like you have lots of, Sorry. I don't know. Being as being part of another community, right? Like, what what do you think about those early communities? Oh, uh, well, I probably didn't start like as as early as as Philip did. Uh, it was back in two thousand and twelve when I got into uh, the Python community. It was it was around the time of the first Python conference, and at that time I was just this young engineer who's just you know like. Uh, fairly, uh, fairly fresh out of college, and I was just like full of things in my head, and I just want to keep on exploring new things. Mm. And obviously, the corp, uh, I mean, standard corporate setup doesn't really kind of like um, encourage that. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of attitude mostly. Um, so, um, so yeah, w- when I joined the conference, I was just mind blown by the whole enthusiasm mm. for learning and sharing new things and it was just like down the rabbit hole I, just, I, I became a volunteer and then eventually incorporated the community be, mm-hmm. became part of the incorporators of the community to be a nonprofit and such right was that your first event yeah the the PyCon conference yes that was my first uh, that was my um, introduction to the whole um, tech community scene Right, but th- th- that's PyCon PH? Uh, or... Yeah, that's correct. But I wasn't really, it, at that time, it was, it was a conference. It was just uh, the Python users group. Um, it wasn't Python PH yet, as, as everyone mm-hmm. knows it now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, afterwards, I mean, obviously, like, if you want to get sponsorship and everything, if you want to continue doing the conference, it has to be, like, backed by a- an actual entity because, you know, like, companies won't sponsor you unless you have, uh, they have like a legal entity to send their monies to. So, so eventually like it, it, we had to, um, we had to incorporate it. I was, and uh, I I got into the organizers, like Miki and I um, contacted the organizers of the first PyCon. Mm. Eventually they thought, Hey, these guys are a bit more enthusiastic than, than usual. So, Hey, (laughs) do do you guys want to like, um, uh, uh, you, do you want to take over? Because we don't want it anymore. It's just too much of a headache. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, enthusiasm kind of like tr- triumphed at that time. And, and, and mm. now we just wanted to like keep on sharing the same uh, feeling that we've had back then to everyone. And so we're still here. <laughs> For sure. 
communities are very important. And really, that's something we believe in at Swarm. And that's why we're, we're having this conversation right now. I think we have a question for Philip. Um, Timothy is asking what map, what map is being shown in your background. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 really, I, I really like that. So this is what, uh, what my team at, at, at Grab is, is building. Um, and this is not real time. Obviously, Zoom is like only allowing like uh, video backgrounds. So as you can see, it's a loop, so the cars are jumping back. Um, but it's basically like an, an allocation of, of vehicles that we have. Um, and like you can see like the different colors indicate like vehicles with passengers, vehicle on the way to passengers, vehicles transporting food at the moment. So this is around Singapore, this is around Marina One is the, the Grab headquarter. So this is like giving you a sense on the, like all the things that are happening on our platform. Right. It's very fascinating. It's always been like important to me, like how maps have, you know, influenced our lives. I like driving a lot, but you know, I prefer driving in the open road, like versus driving in the city because of all the traffic and stuff, you know, but, but yeah, maps has been very instrumental in how we navigate. And can you tell us more about like, you know, a bit about geotech, I guess, like, maybe a bit how you know how it started you know how it evolved a bit about how you you're currently using at grab as well that that is a very it's a very broad question <laughs> so <laughs> let me try to be very concise and not talk an hour about it because obviously i'm very <laughs> passionate about the topic and i can keep going on and on forever so feel free to interrupt but i, I would broadly say right like so i got i got into the geo space around like i think like 2005 or so and i started looking into it um, so like it's been over 15 years and this was like the pre iPhone days, right? Like this was like when, when like navigation still was not like an everybody's daily life, but like, so then it was like a lot, like the, the early stages of geotech were just like digitalizing paper maps, right? Like just getting this like ridiculous paper map in a digital format and making sure that we can automatically locate yourself with like GPS and cramming all of that stuff in the phone. That, that was still really hard, right? Like back in the days, GPS was like 50 to 100 meter accurate because basically the military was like scrambling the signals. You couldn't get like free open GPS, uh, lots, lots of limitations. But just back in the days, the early stage was really just like taking a paper map, getting it digital, locating yourself on it, calculating a few routes to your destinations. That was like really the early stages. And that was really the potential like that I've seen, right? Like when I started my first startup, I've really seen like, this is a technology that everybody needs in their pocket, right? Like everybody, mm -hmm. I get lost so many times. And, and I mean, now it's super obvious, right? Like now nobody can like live a life without like maps on their phones anymore, I guess. Um, so I think that was the early days. And nowadays I think we're moving to a, to a place where maps are like powering so many things behind the scenes that people don't know, right? Like every, like, especially in COVID times, so like every delivery that you get at home, is highly optimized by maps. Like every delivery driver like finds the way to your floor and the apartment complex through complex maps, like thousands and millions of deliveries actually every day across the region get scheduled with that. So now maps are both like in this user facing stuff as well as behind the scenes powering all of our lives. So I think that's kind of where we are. And in the next few years, I think it was like all of this hype around like what like Facebook calls like the metaverse and so on, where you really bring the physical and the digital together. I think we'll see like even like much more embedded use of like maps and like augmented reality, virtual reality, all of those things. So I think that's kind of broadly the three stages that I would see. So, Right. Is Grab focusing mostly, well, because it's more of a, you know, um, a navigation company, right? It's mostly focused on maps that are, um, I guess, on, on cities or, you know, outside. But do you also kind of do internal maps as well? Like inside uh, buildings and stuff? Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously do, right? Like, I think, I mean, keep in mind that one, one of our big verticals is like food delivery. And mm -hmm. a lot of restaurants are like inside like malls and complexes and stuff like that. So obviously we need to make sure that we both get drivers safe on the roads as well as like in buildings. In buildings, for sure, for sure. Like, what do you think are the primary differences, right? I guess in, in terms of data gathering, you know, and processing all that data. Um, like what are the key differences, I guess, in, in those two types of technologies? Like indoor versus outdoor? Yeah. I think the, the big difficulty why, why nobody, in, nobody has really cracked indoor maps. Indoor maps are like kind of the, the holy grail in the industry. Mm. And the reason why indoor maps are so difficult are for, for a couple of reasons. One is 
GPS doesn't work indoor because current GPS technology requires line of sight to the satellites, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so for those of you who don't know basic location where satellites work, you need to see at least three satellites, you measure the signal distance, and then you triangulate your position, right? Like, and that requires that you have uh, basically line of sight to the, to the satellite, right? I'm, I'm vastly simplifying. There's a lot more that goes into that, but that's like the very, the basic gist of it. And that doesn't work indoor. So like uh, indoor, there is lots of other things like how people get located. So mm -hmm. people do a lot of like Wi-Fi location. So they, they try to like do the same thing what I explained with satellites, basically with Wi-Fi access points. But therefore you need to know where the Wi-Fi access points are. So it's also not super trivial. Um, yeah. So I think like the biggest part that's really difficult indoor is really actually figuring out where you are. Like probably like many of you have figured out when you go inside a big mall, then like your phone goes like all crazy and believes you're like, anywhere like in the, in the, you see this like in the gps circle of right like the position like from being like a small dot becomes this like massive blue circle which yeah. like can span like a kilometer or so on um <laughs> so i think that's that's like probably the biggest difference right makes a lot of sense yeah interesting is, is there like kind of like so, so an add-on to that with, with the wi-fi triangulation it seems like it, is is it also similar approach with how we did a, a bluetooth uh by locating each other by Bluetooth. I think that's the that's the way we did it with the COVID tracing and everything. Is, is it is it playing around the same similar concept? Um th so the, the, the difference is the, the COVID tracing apps, right? Like they don't really know where you are. They know whom you're close to. So they know two people are close to, but they don't necessarily because basically Bluetooth is a is a proximity detection, right? Like you know what are the people that are, let's say, in a 10 meter radius of you, and you can measure that. With, with Bluetooth, but that doesn't mean you know actually where these people are, right? Like, so I think there is, there's what, what is in the, the industry, it's called like absolute and relative positioning, right? Like absolute positioning means like an X, Y coordinate, you, you're exactly at this spot. COVID tracement, tra tracing, you can be like somewhere in the basement of a building. We have like no idea where your X and Y coordinates are, but we know like, okay, Matt is within like 10 meters of Aaron. And like, if one of them has COVID, then the other one is likely to have it too, right? Like, and I never knew exactly where you are. So all these COVID tracing apps, they actually don't trace your location, which they say is also good for privacy that people don't like track you all the day. They just track which people you have been close to. Um, so it's, it's uh, the, the concept of using like signal strength to detect like distance is very similar to what I explained in Wi-Fi. But on the, if you want to have a map, then you need to not only know how close you are to something, but where that is, right? Like that's the problem also in Wi-Fi positioning. Even if you know what your distance to a Wi-Fi is, if you don't know what the position of that Wi-Fi is, then you can't locate them, but you just know, hey, this person is X meters from that Wi-Fi, but that is, is not necessarily giving you the absolute location. And then sorry for, for geeking out so, so deeply <laughs> technical. I hope that's okay for the audience here. No, I think that, that the whole point of this talk is to geek out. And yeah, one of the things exactly. actually that you, that you um, had mentioned like in our prep call is this, this evolution of geotech from starting from a very engineering centric to very AI and ML centric discipline. Can you talk a little bit about like how that has evolved and how you've needed to adapt the team that you're building to be able to, you know, to transition that technology? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Like, so, I mean, when I was like building my first geo teams, like AI and ML didn't really like exist as a thing in companies, right? Like back then it was like in research labs at universities. Um, and like back in the days, how people would, would create maps would be, they would like, I mean, the, the open street map community, they would go out with like big GPS receivers because it wasn't like even in phones, right? Like, so they would have like these handheld like Garmin tracking devices oh, and wow. run around the neighborhood and like snap a few photos maybe. And then they would like, like they would download all this information on their computer, sit on these like really complex like GIS tools and like try to like take all these tracks, like draw some lines, this is the road, like take the pictures, name these roads manually and like put some signs on it and so on. Right? Like, so it's like really this super manual heavy like editing process, which this, this GIS software looks like, for those who are not familiar, it looks like kind of like a Photoshop, right? Like you draw lines and you do all of these like complex things very, very complex and very, very labor intensive. And even like professional companies who did it because the effort was so costly. They did this like maybe once a year or sometimes every two years, right? Like they sent these big surveying vans that you might've seen in the neighborhoods. And then like every two years, they said have like thousands of people that are basically editing this data, right? Like this was the original way that, that maps were created. 
And nowadays, how, how it most of the time works is, is just like using big data, right? Like every time, like let's say some simple things, right? Like every time you, you drive around, you often send like your GPS track to a server and then that server calculates like traffic information. If they get tracks from a lot of people and they figure out on this road segment, everybody's slowing down, then the machine learning algorithm just say, okay, this is like a traffic jam on that segment. And then on the other part, right? Like also a lot of, a lot of equipment got much better, right? Like, so a lot of, um, a lot of vehicles are just equipped with like cameras. And then basically you get this, this big amount of imagery data. And in the back end, you just, instead of having like people look at it and manually process it, you just have like computer vision algorithms to process this and automatically like edit the map, right? Like say like, hey, here's a new sign, here's a new this. And, and it's just been like fabulous, right? Like, I mean, computer vision technology has like in the last few years had such massive advances, right? Like I, I, I know when like I started early looking into it, like, and like, if you, I mean, those of you who are like more in the AI and ML community, right? Like they know, there was like this big, like called like this image net moment, right? Like when like for the first time it was like a classification challenge that computer vision algorithm could like classify images. And, and nowadays computer vision has in many areas reached like superhuman capabilities. I can tell you like our vision algorithms can see signs that I cannot. So huh. I can like guarantee you that like from early days, like computer vision, like to give you a sense where like in the early days, like computer vision algorithms had like 50, 60% accuracy at detecting something. And now they are vastly in excess of 95%. So 95%, depending on the chances, like the human baseline, right? Like how good is a human correctly classifying some signs that they see? And now like many areas like computer vision algorithms are like 97, 98%. So they make like half less errors than human make. Um, and at the rate of like improvement in a few years, they'll be like at 99.5% because basically like, I've seen like every like similar to Moore's law, right? Like where like the mm -hmm. compute power like doubles every 18 to 24 yep. months. In many of these areas, there is um, there's something similar in computer vision. So every like 18 to 24 months, like computer vision gets about twice as good roughly since I've seen it evolve. Interesting. Oh, on, 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 uh, more, more on that though, like since, I mean, all, all, all these things kind of like, um, new exciting development in this whole space of um, ML machine, uh, ML, AI and, and, and geotech. Um, uh, what would you say like other industries we don't often hear about that benefit from, from geotech? I mean, apart from the usual ones, I would say, you know, like consumer, the consumer market kind of are familiar yeah. with. Um, no, I think, I think, I mean, it, it's a very difficult to answer question because geotech is like so deeply embedded in so many things that we, that we do. Um, but what, one example that, that I really like is like humanitarian aid is benefiting massively from geotechnology, right? Like, so every, anywhere in the world, when there's like a flood, when there is like anything, uh, any natural catastrophe, right? Like, so there was like the, the, like big earthquakes around the world. And then after that, you always need to send in like people to help, right? Like, and the problem is at that time, when you have a natural catastrophe, no matter if it's a flood or it's an earthquake, typically the real world doesn't look the same as before, right? Like roads are blocked means you can't drive in the traditional path anymore. Houses have, have collapsed. And like, I mean, all of, all of those things. So what, what like modern geotech has helped and there's like this group called like humanitarian OSM, the humanitarian open street map that is specializing in this. And they help to update these maps like within like 24 hours, right? Like, so whenever there's like something happening within like 24 hours, they like update the map, this road is blocked. And, and this is, is, is a great example for geotechnology helping like these like, and there's like lots of cool videos online that people can see like in the Haiti earthquake, how this humanitarian OSM was used and basically getting help in and like coordinating on the ground efforts and stuff like that. So I think that's, that's one, one example that comes to my mind for a cool use case where, where these like fast updating community maps like OpenStreetMap can help to, to get like, uh, get really difficult situations resolved. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, I never heard about uh, you might, the humanitarian version of OpenStreetMap. And yeah, it sounds like it's really something that could really help, especially in disaster. I, I, I just looked it up and apparently there's like a Philippine um, entry there from the last, I don't know, last thing that we needed it. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. Just to riff off of that a bit. 
um, because I guess everyone, you know, is kind of familiar with how Google kind of, you know, gathers their, their mapping stuff, right? They all just send these cars, right? You know, go around everywhere and they update, you know, streets and stuff like very frequently. And for very far flung places, they send people walking with backpacks, right? Uh, with GPS at, um, you know, just um, equipment, you know, mounted on, on their backs so that, you know, that they can gather that geodata, right? But like for open street maps, it's always been puzzling to me. So I, under- I understand that before it was very community focused, meaning like most of the contributions were from the community, right? But I guess I'm just curious, like, are there maybe any um, corporate uh, companies, you know, trying to contribute back using similar tech to Google, you know, in gathering data? Yeah, I think OSM has a lot of companies uh, using it. And uh, without disclosing any proprietary data, so I think hmm. you can look it up in the wiki. So OSM has like asked all companies to like to mark accounts that they contribute, like as company accounts. So you can look it up. So I mean, some of the biggest contributors to OpenStreetMap around the world is like Gra- Grab in Southeast Asia. Over over twenty percent of all OSM edits in Southeast Asia are done by Grab. Um, so so we we're, we're contributing a lot there. Uh, but around the world, there is like um, Apple is a big contributor. Facebook is a big contributor and has a big OSM group. Amazon in the US is a big contributor. So I would say like most of the large tech companies have meaningful OSM usage and also give give back to OSM and, and give their edits to the community so that the companies benefit from the community, but the community also benefits from the company's edits. Um, so I think there's there's lots of really like, um, like-minded people who try to like contribute to a joint effort instead of doing it alone. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so if we're going to look at it from a kind of different perspective, right? Um, we've talked about geotech. We talked about like how it kind of started, right? How it kind of evolved, how you're using it to grab, you know, open street maps and stuff. Like, so if we were going to, you know, hypothetically speaking, if you and I were going to start a new company, Philip, <laughs> and we were going to use maps a lot, right? Um, like how would you kind of build up on you know an organization around this technology um i guess let's say we're gonna do restaurant reviews <laughs> right um, without naming specific companies to do the same thing um but like you know how many people would you need like what type of what, what kind of shape i guess would your organization um, need to look like and i'm asking this question because at swarm we really believe that you know from a technology perspective, um, the tech you're using is just kind of a translation of how your organization works, right? How your organization communicates kind of translates into your technical architecture, right? So that, that, that's kind of why I'm asking, right? So I don't know, what, what's your take? I, I would go to Dex and ask him how much funding he gives me. <laughs> then I would like see how large the, 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 the team is. Um, let's let's but, assume we're bootstrapping. <laughs> oh, you. I think one thing I can say, and this is a conversation I have a lot, geotechnology is very, very expensive, right? Like, so to give you to give you a sense, like some of the large companies in the world have like geo teams in excess of 10,000 people, right? Like, so like, I mean, uh, this is this stuff is like, if you want to build the whole stack, it's very, very expensive. Having, having said that, um, thank God, like most companies and most people don't need to do that, right? Like, so I think what if, 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 if Aaron, if you and I start a small company and bootstrap as, as Dexter has given us very tough limitations, then probably we are gonna use a lot of like the open source and like the APIs out there instead of like reinventing the wheel, right? Like we probably don't wanna build the technology that creates the core maps. But we just like use like OSM, we use like a couple of the open source services like, right, like MapTiler and like OSRM routing engine. So all of that stuff you can like download out of the internet and like get like a really decent service to get started with. Mm -hmm. So I would say like use as much open source technology that you can. And then I think like on top of that, right? Like when you said in your example, like create like restaurant reviews or so on, like once you have like all the base map, all the routing, all of the search figured out, then you can like say you build a very like thin layer of like a good restaurant review product. And that's probably what you want to build, right? Like, I think if you want to build a product like that, you probably don't want to build like the entire geo stack that have like okay. gone like thousands and thousands of man years from other companies have gone in there to develop it. So probably you don't want to do that, but you just want to tackle the thin layer on top where you differentiate and otherwise use as much open sources and open data as you can. Right, makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, at Swarm, actually, we don't have our own backend. We just use Firebase. Um, and for any limitations that we have, we just find, you know, workarounds around it, right? Um, Algolia um, is a search engine. 
um, which is pretty cheap actually. We're currently using it at Swarm as well. It's really doing wonders for us. We don't have to worry about those things and reinventing the wheel, hosting Elasticsearch again <laughs> on our own and stuff. Makes a lot of sense, Philip. Thanks for that. So Matt, you had a really interesting question yeah. uh, like for, for folks, um, you know, where, where to get started. Oh Which yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, in, in in line with in line with like starting a company, like I'll 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 take it like a step back, uh, for 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 people who just wanted to like explore this space, right? So, uh, what would you say like are ideal projects for them to get started with? Um, very very good good question. Um, I, I would say like I'm I'm a strong believer in generally in like an open source technology. So I think one of the best ways to to do something that's useful is either like contribute to an existing open source project or like create your own, right? Like I think the, the beauty and the power of maps is that visualization just speak to people. And I've seen a lot of people in the geo industry like getting started with like some really cool geo visualizations where like saying like, you wanna visualize the, the crime rate in your city, right? Like find like some, some plot where the police releases data about crime and just put it on a map. And then suddenly people can see holy hell, why there's so much crime in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood, right? Like, and that's like, you can like do something that's useful and you can do something that helps you to learn like how geo visualization maps and so on work. So I think in many cases, like what I've seen works really well for people is like take a, take a data set that you can like in many, many cases, you find so many data sets and try to like throw it and visualize it uh, on a map. Uh, that's like a really good way to get get started with geotechnology, and that's how I've like seen many many people like develop like the passion for geotech by just like doing a whole bunch of like cool like data visualizations on maps, and like then usually like they figure out like what happens. You do a data visualization, and then you figure out that the library you're using has like some limitations, and then you just go deeper and deeper in the library and like adopt it, and then like before you know it, you're an expert into this like specific library and geotechnology and like how geodata works, and you see that some data is like rendered off because the accuracy is not great. So the more, the more you do of this, the deeper naturally you'll get into like geotechnology. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and, and, and since you've told us about the humanitarian open street map, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of data there that can be like visually, that can be visualized in, in interesting ways as well. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Also like Alexis just did a shout out here one of the things that he did for, for his data viz class. Very cool. <laughs> Philip, one of the, like, you described your superpower as enabling engineers and engineering teams. I'd love to hear you share about, like, your journey transitioning from that hacker to an IC. But, like, how did you know that you wanted to go down the leadership track? Like, how did you develop that passion? Can you talk a little bit about that, that transition? Yeah, um, I, I think it's like, it always like, in hindsight, it always sounds like very easy, right? Like, so I wish I would have been as wise, Dexter, as you described it, that this was like a path that I chose. It, it was more that I was like thrown into it, right? Like, I mean, in the beginning in my startup, I was coding, and then we figured out that, that my coding is not uh, enough to do it. So we needed to get other people and then like being, being a co-founder, just naturally like thrust into the role that these people just naturally tend to report to you. And, and I was, I would say like a pretty mediocre leader in the beginning because like nobody taught me these skills and so on. Um, but I've, I've had been lucky enough to work with other people together that have been great leaders and that then over time taught me these leadership skills. And I have really seen that, that over time I've became very passionate about it because I think at the end for me, the, the goal is to maximize the impact I can have. And I know that myself, I can only have so much impact but if I multiply my impact by enabling others to do great things, then even if I don't do them and if they do that, then, then that's great. Right? Like, and that's why I've like been like changing my mindset from what do I do? Right? Like it's a very, like as a coder, I was like, you have this very immediate satisfaction, you change a few lines of code and then suddenly something works, which is like all of us who have experienced that it's just magic. Like just this kind of like moment that you have when you compile something and you just see that it works and it does what you expect it to do, that you have the power over the machine. I think that's really cool, right? Like, so this, I've traded this like immediate satisfaction to a more like longer term thing is like helping to uh, 
have other people have this like magic moments and like trying to like get as many people as possible to do that. And like early on, like helping like some, some engineers to do that. And now mostly I'm like mentoring other leaders to mentor other like engineers and so on. So it's been like kind of evolved since my team has gone like fairly large with like a few hundred people. So I think now I'm, I'm unfortunately sometimes a little bit far away from the, from the actual like coding, but I try to stay involved as much as I can. It, I mean, it's phenomenal to, to, to describe it as happenstance to going from, you know, being thrown into being a manager to becoming CTO for a company that got acquired and having to manage that transition and now like leading large teams. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's a, that doesn't sound like a happenstance journey. I mean, I think it's both a thoughtfulness and grit as you're kind of going along the way. Do you, would you say that there's a, um, that technical teams or engineers need to be managed differently? Like are the management principles different uh, when you're overseeing um, engineering teams as opposed to, to, to non-engineering teams? Um, I, I, would, I would say, I mean, look, I haven't, I haven't managed like people in a factory, right? Like, so I think my, my experience is also in the tech domain. So I do think there is, there's certainly uh, but I've overseen like teams of like map analysts and like editors and so on. So I've, I've overseen like a vast span of people, but I wouldn't like say necessarily, right? like I've never overseen somebody working in a restaurant or stuff like that. Right? Like, so my, my experience is also narrowed to the tech domain. Um, I, I do think at, at the core motivation for people, no matter what job are is, is very, very similar, right? Like, I mean, in general, good people want to make an impact. They want to solve complex problems. They want to be challenged. Right, like so, I think all, all of those things is like the. I think the core human nature is that not dependent if you're an engineer, if you're a product manager, designer, or if you are like a finance person, like working in in, in accounting or controlling. Right, like I think. So I think from the from the core motivation, I think like, and I've obviously like several of those functions. Right, like it's very it's very similar. Having having said that, um, I do think like engineers are are broadly speaking still a like um they, they they do really like this like really deep problem solving right like i think what i would say the difference between a great engineer and a not so great engineer is that and you can tell this in job interviews right like the great engineer asks you like do you have a problem that's hard enough for me and the not so great engineer is like hey is it like is it like too difficult for me or is like is it okay with my skills to solve right like and i think this is what you can always tell when somebody wants to have a harder problem and not an easier problem, right? Like, and I think that is kind of like what I've seen how to manage like great engineers is making sure that you keep them in the sweet spot of the challenge, right? Like, which means like you need to challenge them enough, but you can't challenge them with something crazy, right? Like you can't say like, oh, you need to invent a quantum computer in 12 months, right? Like then they're just like, okay, it's just a, I mean, I, I, maybe somebody in this team has somebody that can do that. Uh, I, I, I don't, and I don't know how to do it. And I think this is like kind of like for engineers really like it's it's actually for me it's very simple it's two things right like keeping them challenged and then removing all the obstacles that they have right like especially like once you're in a larger organization organization that throw so many processes at you that that keep you from like this problem solving so I think as a manager I try to keep as many of the organizational bureaucratic things out of people's way and then like make sure that they understand what are the difficult challenges and then get out of their way and let them solve it right like that's kind of like the, my my high level like engineering leadership philosophy i think you are about to have 50 applicants for <laughs> grab um, <laughs> interestingly i think this is one of the things that a lot of uh having built the company in in a um, couple parts of the world you know it's not as uh, this this notion that you're not just here to create um you're not just here to assign tasks and bodies of work, but you're also there to enable people and remove obstacles such that they can glide and be, you know, it's it, that, that often isn't, it, it's, um, it's a, it shouldn't be taken for granted because it's not always like that. Um, you know, you also built a company uh, like that transcended, that was international, right? Uh, uh, Scobler was, uh, was German and you had, you built a technical team in Romania and it's really interesting because like, you know, that, that the Philippines is also very similar 
in the in the regard that there are a lot of international companies who are setting up operations here. Many of us work for international companies that transcend uh, global. Share a word or two like about something that like, was what did, what are some of the challenges that you had to overcome by creating a multinational technical uh, technology team? Yeah. Yeah. And I think like cultural learning was like one of the massive journeys that I had to undergo. I can like say right like from from going to Germany to to Romania to Silicon Valley where I lived then five years now to living like in, in Asia and Singapore. Uh, I think culture is like vastly different, right? Like, and I think for, for things around like conflict, right? Like, so let's say German culture uh, really likes like constructive conflict and debates. Like in in Germany. It is, it is very common to really very openly challenge each other. And I have seen that doesn't go really well in other cultures. <laughs> so like, I think it is like seen, especially if you do it in a public forum, it is like really seeing as people losing face and so on. So I do think like what I've learned is depending on which kind of teams I work with and like how much international exposure these teams have, I, I vastly need to change the style on how I work with people, right? Like when when, um, for example, when I was going from Germany to Romania in the beginning, in, in Germany, it's very common to like challenge your boss and like just go at it. In, in, in like, in, when I went to, like, to Romania and then I like, what I wanted to do is give like people a challenge, but they would just execute what I tell them because they said they can't challenge the boss. And then I would do something that is like the, it's not a good thing, right? Like, so I said like, hey, I would do this. And I meant like, hey, this is my idea. If you have a better idea, challenge it and do it differently. And they would say, boss says orders do this and they would do exactly that and then it wouldn't work i said why do you build something that doesn't work I said you told us to i said no i said this is an idea it's your job to figure it out right like so i have this is like problems at the beginning and it didn't make any sense to me it's like why would people do this on earth to me why don't they think and challenge me and then i've learned oh i need to change my leadership style i just need to lead more from the back in those cultures and more like, instead of giving them a suggestion, asking them, what would, what would you do? How would you do this? And instead of like giving them an idea, giving them a problem statement, right? Like say, hey, this is the problem. How do you tackle it? And like, again, then very different, like in, 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 in like Singapore, I have now a large part of my team is sitting in Beijing, right? Like, so you need to work different with different people. Again, at the core, I think people all want very similar things. But community, often this can get lost in communication and it's really worth for people to invest into like understanding where somebody that you're working with is culturally coming from uh, to make sure you can create the best impact together. Yeah, and I've, I've, by the way, I've loved this journey. I think for me, it was just personally seeing so many assumptions that I had about how things are working challenged allowed me to really like say like be much more humble myself and say like, look, maybe my idea is like stupid and maybe like somebody else can do it much better. And maybe it's much better for me to just like listen more. So. Yeah, that's, that's what my, uh, my team reminds me of uh, generally, like my ideas are stupid and they very <laughs> German on. challenging their boss. I think that's just, no matter where I go, I think like I, uh, uh, it's what I'm faced with, but I think it's phenomenal because that kind of, um, it shows that there's an ownership um, like if you can create a like th and that's one of the things that I'm trying to learn is like how do you create a space for people to take ownership and feel comfortable enough to kind of assert right and you know your your lesson about sometimes for those those cultures you present a problem statement and to lead from behind or ways to tease out I think there's some similarities uh you know having built a company in the Philippines with folks um not so much they're incapable or they're predispositioned to, to wanting to take instructions and to execute instructions. I think that the work environments kind of condition it. Like even the schools condition a, here's, the, here's what I want, give me this, right? And it's, uh, and it's one of the things that I had to adjust to as well. So I, I, totally, I totally get it. Now, I think like Matt and, and Philip, some, something that you both have in common is that you've invested time in not just building companies and teams, but building, building communities, right? And building uh, uh, the ecosystem, um, network of people. Like Matt, I'm interested to hear from you in terms of what you know, how did you get involved with uh, uh, or think about building a, a community around Python? Like, what were the conditions that were present that made you think, okay, I, 
building a community is needed here in the Philippines? Oh, that's a that's a very yeah that, that's a very nice question. And at the same time, uh, I was kind of like gave me flashbacks of of my time <laughs> in the past as well, because uh, it it really just happened. Um, it it kind of like aligns with I'd say um, similarly with uh, how 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 Philip kind of like said it earlier like in terms of you know like um, in terms of like culture it's kind of like dealing with different cultures like I feel like it's it uh, I I'll try to like uh, get into my point in a little bit here but uh, basically uh, there's this idea about um, I don't know maybe it's like a Filipino or an Asian culture thing where we don't usually like get trained to be like speak out um uh however like it doesn't mean that we we didn't uh we don't have those thoughts um because i had those thoughts when i was like starting out uh, early in my career i just didn't it just that didn't feel right to, to speak them out um but then i got involved uh when i joined a, a certain group like say, uh, the python user group at that time uh people are just like more open. It, it's like, it, it has this certain, you have a cer suddenly you have like this certain area where you can kind of like be amongst uh, friends of sorts. Like you can kind of like just talk and speak your, 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 your mind out and, 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 and they would, and, and you would get meaningful conversations from there. Um, so, so it's really more like finding that particular tribe of yours in a way. And, um, and so, when and and like fast forward a few months later like Miki and I joined the first PyCon conference and then we met more people and then and then the whole idea just kind of like I mean the whole environment just kind of like empowered us to like seek this type of environment more and make it part of our lives and and, and so that's what that, that's what we did um it was really like me and me and Miki at that time so so we kind of at, at the time uh, we, uh uh, we kind of are that group of people together, but then we found out there's a larger group that kind of like thinks uh, the same way, and we just wanted more of it. And we thought, hey, there's definitely a lot more people like us, and we want to continue keep um, continue providing this space for such people and just be available for them uh, when they find it. So yeah, that's amazing, and. and you know, Philip, it's it's really phenomenal. Like when you when you started to build your technical team in Romania, what really stuck out to me was that you wanted to give back to the Romanian community. So for many of you who uh, might not have seen it in the promos, so Philip's not just an engineering leader; he is a technology influencer. He has he co-hosts. He is he is like the Carson Daly of the Eastern European. European tech scene. Uh, he's the chairman of uh, Techsylvania. And like, just, just for context, this year, the, uh, uh, the CEO of Stack Overflow is speaking, the head of engineering at uh, Airbnb. Um, Mark Cuban, I think, spoke. Like, was it last year? Yeah. Was it you or Vlad that interviewed him? Uh, well, I, I was on the call with Mark Cuban. We actually had Kara Swisher interview him. Oh, OK. But I did, I did the intro and like talk with them in the pre-call, but like actually we had Kara Swisher do a Mark Cuban interview. That was quite fun. Oh, that's like, tell us a little bit about that, that like, how did you know, or like, how did you think about starting a tech community, a tech event in Eastern Europe? So it, it, it dated back, right? Like I was, I was early on when I, when I started my, my startup Scrabble, I was initially living in Berlin. And then due to the tech talent, we opened a, a team in, um, in Romania. And I did because like then like out of like we were like 100 people in the company, like 90 were in Romania. So I, I moved over to, to Romania, basically. I still had like a small flat in Romania. And I really missed the tech scene from Berlin. Right? Like Berlin had a very vibrant tech community. And I was like joining lots of events and like part of like lots of the early communities in Berlin, like especially at that time, like the mobile communities and like... like Again, like when like the smartphones came up and I really enjoyed that. And also the entrepreneurship community. When I started my company, I was lucky enough that in these entrepreneurship community were like basically like self-help groups, right? Like 
I mean, when you start a company and I'm sure like Dexter, you can like, and Aaron, you can relate to that. It's a very scary thing. If you've been an engineer before and suddenly you have to deal with like finances and all of that stuff, then like you really need a lot of help. And that's why like I got like embroiled involved into this entrepreneurship communities and the mobile tech communities. And, and that is like kind of what I've seen, like, wow, this has helped me so much in my journey becoming an entrepreneur. And then I moved to Romania and back in the day that virtually didn't exist. There was not a single like entrepreneurship event in inclusion, the city that I was. And I met like, and I think you had like Vlad here for, for an interview, I think with, with you guys as well, right? Like, and so I met like Vlad, um, Vlad who was like a local and he was like back then he was like working like for Nokia there. And I, I met him for beers and I said like, hey dude, like I really miss this, right? Like in, in Cluj there's like nothing. And probably we had like a few to beer, beers too many. And then we just said, okay, let's just start one. I mean, like if there's none, then we should just start one. And we started then originally uh, to bring like startup weekend to, to Cluj, right? Like, so this is like an international format. It's like fairly easy to organize, right? Like you don't need to like invent everything. They have like a template. And we just like, both of us did it. Like my, my company donated like some money to like run it. And we got a few volunteers together and we just organized the first startup weekend in Cluj and like got like really good response. Got like, I don't know exactly like a hundred people or so on. And then we seen like, okay, cool. We've run a few startup weekends. Like, oh, this is really cool. How about we do this bigger? How about we bring like some speakers in and then like basically um and and then basically like ideas about like Pennsylvania started that's what I read Vlad did right like I played a very minor role in that I helped like moderate it and like uh cheer like behind the scenes and stuff like that so I I do get like a lot of the benefits from doing it but Vlad is the one he's like restlessly harassing these people like Mark Cuban and like uh we had like the Ubuntu founder Mark Shuttleworth and so on so he's like constantly telling these people, hey, there's like a new thriving tech ecosystem happening in Romania. And you need to come and talk to these people to inspire them, to share with them what's possible. Um, yeah. And I think like what everything started as a silly idea over, over drinks, uh, being like now was like, I mean, last time when it was in person, it was like 3000 people showing up. So it was a fairly big thing. And now virtually, I think it's even bigger. So um, yeah, it's been a really interesting journey and what I've been lucky to be, be part of. I like on that note, I wanted to sh do a shout out also like to Mickey and I think and just here with uh, Women Who Code. It's another phenomenal group, uh, another community that's uh, burgeoning here in the Philippines. I like, and it it's one of the things um, that I think is really remarkable, um, both about you, Matt and Philip, because the, the takeaway for me is that you don't have to have a grand vision or have a grand uh, plan in mind to start, you know, to start to make waves in your own communities. You started with a personal need, like a personal, like I wanted to speak out more and find people who are more like me. Or in Europe, I missed home. I missed the support that I needed. But the difference is, is that you just weren't afraid or you just defaulted towards action, right? You just did something about it. It didn't have to be grand. And I think that's one of the things that e where ecosystems can start, like, um, you know, I uh, was involved with Caliber. Many people on the call now were involved with Caliber here in the Philippines and Indonesia. And, you know, it's very early in that ecosystem. It's changing now. Like Indonesia's already been booming. The Philippines is starting to attract foreign capital. A bunch of startups are getting into, um, into White Combinator. A few of the folks in the call here have their own companies. Some of us work for uh, Silicon Valley companies but here in the Philippines. But that ecosystem is starting to get built now, right? This is, this is when the seeds are being laid. And I think that one of the things that I had to adjust to in, in the Philippines is that maybe I think there's a little skepticism of each other, um, but when people open up and when people kind of invest and pay that trust forward, amazing things can happen, right? And I think, my goodness, Philip, you just like, I didn't have a, I just started because I wanted to hack my video games to, to you know, <laughs> heading, uh, you know, the company that touches each and every, everyone probably every week uses your products. It's probably, I, I mentioned earlier, not to flatter them, that after social media, I think Grab is the number one used app in the Philippines, you know, and it literally, you're moving people, you are guiding people, um, you know, efficiently. So I think like um, it's uh, it's phenomenal. And I think for the folks who are on this call, like start 
I challenge you to think about what are some of the ways in which you can help be that ecosystem just for the people around you, right? Because, uh, you know, for Matt, it resulted in creating probably the most, one of the most active tech communities in the Philippines. For Philip, it had resulted in building the largest Eastern European uh, tech ecosystem. And it all started by just solving their own problem with the people that they cared about who are around them. And I think that's a space that we hope to create for you all in Swarm. Um, you know, I think that that's, uh, we love this conversation. I think there's probably nobody's coding right now, nobody's designing because we're all like on the phone, just excited to talk to people like Philip and Matt and, um, you know, to, to have gather like this, have this gathering. I think this is kind of for us, what really matters is building this kind of community. So uh, maybe uh, Matt, like for folks who aren't already aware or um, want to join Python PH, where can they go to, to kind of get connected? Uh, yeah, so if uh, anyone here who is not, uh, who had, who is, uh, yeah, who, who wanted to join us as well. So we have, all, all of our social media links are on uh, python.ph. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook. Our Facebook group is Python, uh, Python PH as well. So yeah, I mean, join us there. Uh, current, uh, I, I also just wanted to take this opportunity to answer one of the questions here about Python PH, like how are we like adapting our, our activities for the pandemic? So uh, we are currently running a webinar series um, as well. So where, where we interview uh, Pythonistas who are working from home, showing us their work setup and telling us, you know, like kind of like just continue giving a sense of community even though everyone's kind of like stuck at home at the moment. So. Yeah. That's phenomenal. It looks like uh, quite a few of your uh, members are representing Python today. Um, Python PH, it's awesome. And I think, Philip, everyone knows where to find Grab, but maybe um, say a few words about like uh, Techsylvania. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I think I think somebody shared the, the link earlier, right? Like, so, I mean, definitely uh, ping, ping me or Vlad, we can like get, get you like free tickets if you want to join virtually. Everything is virtual now anyway. So just like, um, yeah, enjoy that if you, if you want. And I mean, the other thing that I wanted to say to what like Dexter has said, right? Like, I think if, if people are a bit scared to join communities, it's been like one of the most like rewarding experience for me, right? Like I never did it like for the benefits, but there's, there's first of all, you're gonna spend time with people that are passionate about what they're doing, right? Like, because it's not like a job, nobody like hates what they're doing. If you don't like a community event, you don't go there, right? Like, so it's like as simple as that, that by definition, everybody that's doing that loves what they're doing because they, they don't get any money or anything from that. So this is like the highest group of motivated people you can find. So that's like kind of my life design principle to spend time with people that love what, what they're doing. And there's nothing more rewarding than that. But other than that, right, like the other thing that, that I want to say is also over building these connections, right? Like so many good things have happened in my life that I was I could have never planned, right? Like, so I think I shared with, with Dexter, that I, I got my job at Grab uh, just totally serendipitously due to like a community friend of mine, right? Like, so I mentioned earlier, I started uh, with, with Vlad, we started like the startup weekend in Romania. And like one of the facilitators, one of the volunteers, he moved to join Grab. And I, when I was on a flight from Australia to Germany, I had a stopover in Singapore and I just wanted to get a, get a beer with him. And like he convinced me that Grab had so many problems with their maps that they needed somebody to help. And he convinced me at the end to join. Right? Like, and if I wouldn't have been part of that community, that would have never happened. So I, I would just say like, don't do it for the benefits of it, but clearly uh, it's a lot of fun and there's just like a lot of benefits down the, down the line. Or another friend of mine used to be like a core committer in Bitcoin and he early on convinced me to buy some Bitcoin. Also that didn't work out well. So mm -hmm. I think this is all benefits from like joining communities that you just like, get like amazing things happen. I, I'd like to add more uh, onto that as well. Like uh, the, the way, uh, one of the things that, uh, the way we like to visualize this is that it's kind of like uh, how, how you like balance like uh, two areas of your life. Like, I mean, I mean, in general, so there's always that area of your life where you need to work and work for a living and things like that. And then there's like this area of your life where you need to enrich yourself in order to give you more energy to face that other part of your life and having a community, being around a uh, like-minded group kind of feeds that area of your life. 
Um, so it's kind of like your yin and yang kind of sort of thing, if you want to look at it that way. So yeah, for sure. And I've also like learned um, as an individual contributor as well, like I, I really just wanted to code a lot and things like that. Uh, I think I, I would attribute a lot of my leadership um, growth uh, in, in, in on the community side of things. Like I wouldn't have had like progress as, as, as I did in my career if it hadn't been for, for my involvement uh, with the community, like, like growing myself and, and growing with everyone else um, has made me like a better uh, contributor to, my, to, my, to that other part of my life. So. I think like, you know, we're, uh, Matt, just the, the growth that many folks in the community here, because Python PH was, has, has matured, it, it puts on events. I think it's really set people on a career path where they're able to work for global companies, global standards, and learn global standards. So I think that's phenomenal. And Philip, I think for those of us who use Grab, we are very grateful that you took that beer because maps have improved. <laughs> like my, you know, my ability to get around has greatly improved. And I think the problems that you'd faced before is just it's phenomenal. Um, for uh, we'll go ahead and uh, let the speakers go. But for uh, many of you who I think uh, know each other on the call, feel free to stick around and uh, say hi to each other. But I wanted to um, uh, sign off, and then I'll uh, Aaron. You can do the, have the final word. I just want to say thank you uh, to Philip. It's just I was inspired. I'm inspired. I'm encouraged to continue on this path. And Matt, I think it's really great for us to be able to connect the communities that are that we're building kind of jointly together. And many of you who are on the call, I know I reached out to quite a few of uh, you on social media. Really grateful that you had a chance uh, to, to connect with us. Uh, we'd love your feedback. And we actually have a great network and a, you know, we hope to do more talks like this with folks like Philip. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really a privilege today, Philip, uh, to have you. And thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Um, yeah, all the way from um, Singapore. So Aaron, maybe you can uh, sign us off. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks, Philip. Uh, thanks, Matt. And thanks, Dexter. Um, <laughs> Dexter has been reaching, you know, a lot of people. And I think most people, a lot of people who attended today um, were people who Dexter contacted himself. Um, but today has been a very special event. Um, we learned about, you know, a bit about geotech. We learned about how communities are very central to um, could be very central to you know how developers can work, how engineers can work better, and you know here at Swarm we're all about working better together. So we we were supposed to have a Q and A, um, but you know Philip and Matt, you can you can drop off if you have to. Uh, you know we don't we don't want to take too much of your time. Thanks super uh, so much you know for 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 being with us today. Um, but we're gonna have we're, so on Swarm um, we we have a wait list, <laughs> so we're encouraging everyone to just. You know, sign up for our waitlist, um, which is just waitlist.swarm.work. So I'm typing it right now. Um, and yeah, we're going to create a swarm um, on Swarm itself. If that's a bit confusing, then you're obviously not on the platform. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But like, uh, we're, it's essentially just like a forum um, where we can discuss stuff, right? So we're going to create a swarm specifically for this event. So if you want to continue the conversation there, feel free. Um, you should also follow us on Twitter because we're very, very active on Twitter, um, which is, you know, just swarm work. Um, I pasted that as well. We would like to thank um, our community partners for this event. So TechSylvania for sure. And also people from Python PH um, who, who are here, right? Most of them are here. Um, and, you know, we, we really like working with them and we hope to continue working with each other in the future. So, so yeah, Pat, I think you have a couple of other announcements. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I would like to, uh, invite everyone. So we usually do a monthly webinar, um, uh, for Python PH. So it's a work from home, a day in the life of a work from home Pythonista webinar series. Um, so it happens every month. Uh, this coming September, we will be interviewing, uh, we will be, our guest would be Georgie Kerr and a, and a friend, uh, we're still finalizing. Uh, who that person is, but um, Georgie Kerr is uh, currently uh, one of the PyCon chairs of, of PyCon Thailand, and they are hosting PyCon APAC 2021. So uh, there will be a, a, a bit of conversation around that uh, uh, on, on the end, on the fourth week of September. 
I believe that's the last Saturday of September, uh, September 25. So yeah, I'm, I, I'd like to invite everyone there. Okay, awesome. We'll help get the word out for that too. Okay. Thank you. Wait, I think Philip is still here. Um, if you have, <laughs> no, no, not anymore. I think. Oh yeah, he's I, here. I, I'm here, of course. Yeah. <laughs> if you have anything you would like to announce, or I don't know. Yeah, I think no, so. I, I, I don't have any any announcements, but I'd love to meet uh, all of you in the Philippines. Like, hopefully, when like physical meetups are possible yeah. again, I'll 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 I'll, I'll drop by in uh, in person and hopefully can can join one of those. Would really really love to. Yeah. So. We have great food. It's uh, it's it's good for the soul, but bad for the heart. Uh, <laughs> Is it <laughs> okay everyone well thank you so much for signing on we'll go ahead and sign off the the live stream now matt and philip thank you so much aaron you did a great job thank so thank you and everyone feel free to stick stick around if you want to hang out